So let me start off by talking about physical activity. So it turns out physical activity has a great deal of benefits. I've heard numerous doctors talk about it as being the best drug that exists. Um, it reduces um, stress, depression, anxiety, um, which is already a great start. And also it's been linked to reduced incidences of numerous diseases like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, osteoporosis, even some forms of cancer. Um, can be, risk of same can be reduced um, by actually engaging in regular physical activity. Um, there's even further beyond that, there's uh, suspicions now that um, increased physical activity can reduce incidence of um, Alzheimer's in later life. Um, there's the, there's um, linkage as well to um, uh, the increase of a protein called BDNF, which can help in um, repair of brain damage. Uh, just in general, physical activity is a really good thing. I want to point out one thing, which is actually a fairly wide misconception, is that increased physical activity rarely leads to weight loss, which is kind of the number one thing people um, aim for. But, uh, but there's a lot of other reasons why it's a good thing. Yeah, they don't matter. Appreciate that, Cindy. So the downside, though, is um, so every year um, participation in Canada releases a report card on physical activity among kids. And this is a very, very dreary document that comes out each year. Um, so they rank, um, looking at kids over the years, um, very young kids don't do too badly in terms of recommended levels of exercise. So 70% are getting at least three hours a day of daily active activity. Um, by the time kids are getting into this age 5 to 11 range, it falls off precipitously. At this point, they're looking for 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous level of activity and um, only 14% are getting that. So think about this, age, kids age 5 to 11, 14% are getting an hour a day of exercise. That's actually, I mean, it's, it's very surprising. And it gets worse, that so once they get into the 12 to 17 range, the requirement remains the same, an hour a day of exercise, and only 5% are getting it. So, um, very, very kind of bad news, and as we've seen from the previous slide, this can, um, this can lead to problems in later life. Um, there's definite linkage towards physical activity um, in, uh, in childhood to ongoing physical activity as people get older. So what are the reasons that physical activity drops off? Well, again, referring to this participation report, they have a number of, um, of uh, hypotheses. Um, so one linkage is to what they call inactive transport, which is in previous generations, kids would walk or bike to work. Now kids get driven to work. Um, another is increase in sedentary activities. So um, among very young kids, they're spending seven and a half hours a day in completely sedentary activities. The definition of a sedentary activity is what you're all doing right now. <laughs> um, and then up to nine and a half approximately for kids in that 12 to 17 hour range. And so what are sedentary activities? Well, obviously a big one, frankly, is sitting in the school, um, uh, you know, sitting in chairs doing schoolwork. But, um, Screen time is, is really a very big factor nowadays, so television um, and increased uh, computer use often in the form of video games. Um, but that physical education at school has dropped way off. So we're looking at only roughly half of kids in, enrolled in school um, actually have structured physical activity as part of their curriculum. Um, and then the last one they, they cite is um, what they call the protection paradox, which is an increased concern on parents' parts about the safety of their kids, um, which leads to everything like driving their kids to school because they are worried about their kids walking to school, or worried about their kids just being out in the neighborhood playing with other kids, worried about the safety of playgrounds, so they're not allowed to play in playgrounds, etc. So all of these together have, um, have led to a decrease in physical activity in kids. So coming around to the topic of my talk, um, one area that has been um, put forward as, um, as a potential part of the puzzle um, is extra games. And so these are games that have a physical activity component. This is one of my students and his girlfriend playing uh, Connect Adventures. Um, and the idea there, as you can see in the video, is that playing the game requires gross motor movement. So in this case, it's, it's jumping um, to control um, this uh, little raft in the game. And um, so the idea is that um, 
this can provide another outlet for physical activity. Um, it can be tied to screen time, so you know, basically if kids are going to have screen time, at least make the screen time good screen time where they're physically active. Um, there's a hope that this can lead as kind of a gateway to other physical activities by reducing the intimidation level and even building up some kind of basic core habituation um, around physical activity. So uh, we've been doing research in this area for um, it's uh, kind of uh, actually more than 10 years now, and um, so I'm 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 going to pick on um, a few basic topics, um, hitting on some of the research we've done over the years. Uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of designing for exertion, how you design games to make them more useful for uh, exertion interfaces. I'll talk a bit about converting on existing games into extra games. Um, we've done a lot of work in recent years on extra games for kids with cerebral palsy as being a particular group who are underserved by fitness opportunities, and also extra games as a social outlet. Um, so, let's start out with the first topic, which is um, designing for exertion. So again, let's come back to some of these um, ex uh, exertion guidelines. Um, in North America, one of the big sources of guidelines is um, the American College of Sports Medicine. They, review, they release um, a book periodically with updated guidelines. These are the minimums they're looking for, so um, for adults. Uh, 30 minutes of exercise um, five times a week, or 20 minutes three times a week at a vigorous intensity. And so we now have to talk about what do these intensity numbers mean. Um, they're measured in terms of heart rate reserve, so kind of a low end, 40% of heart rate reserve is, is the minimum. Uh, and more, more, more vigorous is 60 to 90 percent. What does this heart rate reserve mean? Well, uh, let me just, since we're going to be using that term quite a bit in the talk, let me just define it. Um, people have as a, oh, well, here's not going to work. Um, people have a, okay, so at this point you're dead. A resting heart rate is your minimum heart rate. Basically what you have is you first wake up in the morning before you start thinking about the stress of your day ahead. Um, and then max heart rate is if you go absolutely full out, full out exercise to the point that your heart can beat no faster, that's your maximum heart rate. And so this bit in the middle from your resting to your maximum heart rate is called heart rate reserve. And so, for example, then this moderately vigorous exercise idea at 60% of heart rate reserve is basically 60% of this number plus the resting heart rate. And that way you can specify um, an exercise target that's customized to the individual um, by the cause it takes into account of the resting of the maximum heart rate. Okay, so let's talk about this idea of extra game sounds great in principle, but how much does it actually get your heart moving? How does it do in terms of these ACSM targets that we just talked about in the last slide? And um, so we all probably remember when the Wii came out um, Wii Sports was uh, one of the things that uh, came with the uh, came out, and a lot of people were lining up at Walmart to buy their Wii so that they could get fit. And so here's <laughs> this is Mallory, one of my students, playing Wii tennis, and uh, I don't think she's necessarily going to get very fit out of this activity. Um, so negligible heart rate increase as a result of doing that. Um, there have been many many studies on uh, energy expenditure. Um, actually, Anthony, who I don't think is here, is, um, has, uh, has actually done research in this area as well. Um, but um, the idea is that, uh, so one study, for example, is uh, kids playing Dance Dance Revolution actually do get to the low end of, um, of uh, physical activity recommendations, but their play only lasts six minutes. So they have to be playing an awful lot of DDR2 to, to be able to get to the point that they're meeting a daily recommendation. So maybe this has some benefit in terms of contributing, but not really a good replacement for going out jogging or playing soccer or whatever. Um, Wii Sports Tennis, I just showed you a video of that, um, does not meet, have an, enough activity to meet the ACSM guidelines. Um, uh, there have been some counters. I'm, I'm, I'm showing just a selection. There have been dozens of studies in this area. Um, but our own Liberty Exer game actually has shown that we can, with kids with CP, get um, seven of eight of the kids we tested initially were able to get up to the moderately vigorous heart rate level. So it depends on the game, it depends on the setup, um, but it's a very mixed 
result. Um, certainly, if you just go to uh, the store and pick up a Wii and hope that that's going to make you a fit person, odds are not that great. So what that leads us to think is that it's important to what we say what we call design for exertion. That um, what has happened in the early extra games is that people have built games which involve some kind of gross motor movement, like swinging to hit your tennis ball, and in a sense hope for the best, hope that the, um, that the consequence is going to be that people um, will be getting a workout along the way. And the studies um, that I've cited, plus many more, have tended to show that this, this doesn't really turn out to, to be the case. Um, so we basically need what I'm calling a toolkit. I don't mean in the sense of a software toolkit. I mean in the sense of a set of design techniques that can be applied to extra games where we know that these techniques tend to help. And so to kind of push along with that, we developed a technique called heart rate power-ups, which we view as being one of um, possibly a set of design techniques that could be available to extra game designers to allow them to, to build extra games that actually do get the heart, uh, the heart going. And so the idea behind heart rate power-ups, um, and this is Mallory Ketchison's work, the uh, woman we saw on the slide earlier, um, is that when people maintain their heart, their target heart rate in the game, so basically we have them wear a heart rate monitor as they're playing, when their heart rate is within the target zone, they get some kind of in-game benefit, and that provides, um, that provides some incentive to, to keep the heart rate up. So we put this into pedaling-based games where we have people on a stationary bike, and, um, uh, and the idea is that you'll have more incentive to pedal harder if there's actually an in-game benefit coming from having a higher heart rate. So the game I've shown here is called Dozo Quest, um, and it's um, an example of a game where we put into this. Um, if we look at kind of two versions of it, this is the version where heart rate is below the heart rate power up. You can kind of see that because this little beating heart symbol is small here. Here you have the power up, the symbol is much more visible. Um, and so between the two cases, without the power up, this is the avatar, with the power up, the avatar becomes more kind of dangerous looking, takes on a difficult physical appearance, which gives a very strong indication that the power up is active. Um, the avatar becomes more powerful, it hits harder, it has more hit points and therefore can take more damage before uh, it dies and so forth. So that together with these two, there's um, a very strong sense of, of getting a better avatar um, uh, through having the power up. And this is a generic technique that you can apply this idea to um, a wide range of games, the idea of giving people extra powers as a consequence of having the power up active. Um, so here's a, there we go. So here's um, an example of another game, um, Beery Brawl, where we put the heart rate power ups in. Um, this is kind of a multiplayer uh, fighting game where you play as a jellyfish and you jellyfish punch the other jellyfishes. And, um, and so, um, without the, with the power-up, once the power-up is added, um, the, your jellyfish has um, a higher rate of um, healing of hit points, so you have higher uh, survivability. This is shown off by having these um, kind of little healing symbols coming out, and also the bot hits harder, or sorry, the, the avatar hits harder. And so, um, this is again another example of where pedaling faster winds up giving you an in-game advantage. Um, so after experimenting with this in a bunch of games, we um, came to the conclusion that the, the, the notion of heart rate power-ups can work effectively. Um, the effect has to be visually clear, like in that example here. It's very obvious when you have the effect versus not having it. The impact should be balanced, and this is, winds up being something where we've had to do a lot of um, uh, iteration over the design of the technique so that um, it's, it's tempting to give you massive powers for having the power up to make the incentive very strong. That tends not to work well. You want the game to be still playable without the power up and to be playable better with the power up. Um, overpowering the power up means the game has no challenge anymore, which actually can become a counter incentive. And the activity should be coupled to the effect that basically as you dip in and out of your target heart rate zone, the effect should be coming on and off, and it should be very obvious that the effect is there. Um, so we tried this out, 
and um, we uh, we implemented it in three different games. Um, here you can see Dan, he's got pedaling, so we're measuring his cadence. Um, we saw his heart rate monitor, so you can, we can measure his heart rate in real time. And he's playing that Dozo Quest game. Um, we tried it with three different games. The games varied in terms of their typical exertion level. So the Dozo Quest is a very low exertion game. You can, um, it's a bit more placid. Geku Race is a racing game that's very high energy. And the Beery Brawl, which we looked at before, is kind of somewhere in between the two. And we compared the power-ups um, coming from heart rate, as I just described it, versus the control condition where they would also get heart power-ups about half the time, but it was random, so that uh, it was not coupled to pedaling hard. Um, and so then look at the effect on exertion, and um, here's where this came out, that um, we saw um, differences in exertion levels in two of the games, Hotel Request and Beery Brawl, in the racing game that was very high octane to begin with. We saw an increase, but it wasn't statistically significant. Um, what's interesting is um, this was bringing all of the games well into the recommended target heart rate zones. So um, again, if you think of 40% of heart rate reserve as kind of the minimum, 60% is getting into that moderately vigorous range. Um, they're all they're all doing well at, at, at getting into the range where we would expect health benefits to accrue from the physical activity. Um, the interesting thing here, and in retrospect, it's obvious is we got less benefit when the game was already quite vigorous. Uh, in the game that was the, had the least vigor associated with it, the Dozo Quest game, we saw the biggest difference. So uh, we declared victory and, uh, and now <laughs> pass that on to other designers of extra games. Um, the other, so the following on to that is we have been interested in a while with the problem that um, we've been developing all our own games in-house, um, that's expensive. Um, it uh, takes a lot of resources. Um, in general, uh, I think one of the most frequent questions I get when I present this work is, just, couldn't you just take existing games and put exercise into them? And we heard this enough that we decided to give it a try. So that's what this part of the talk is about. And I'll pitch this as saying the reason that this is interesting has to do with adherence. Um, so. We talked already about the idea that it's a challenge to get exercise levels up to a decent level with extra games. Um, it's also a challenge to get people playing them over the long term. I don't know how many of you have a piece of exercise equipment at home that's kind of sitting in the basement that you bought it and for a few weeks you used it a lot and now it kind of probably gathers dust down there. Um, uh, same thing kind of tends to happen if you buy yourself um, a Wii sports device or a Kinect for doing physical activity that again, it's really good for a while and then begins to tail off. Um, and so studies of use of extra games have tended to, have tended to back this up. Um, so for example, Baranowski and colleagues did a 13-week trial of Wii Fit in the home um, with 78 kids, and there was no positive effect on activity level. Um, Owens and colleagues, again, a three-month home trial of, um, again, the Wii Fit, and um, again, no improvement in daily uh, physical activity and consequently no improvement in um, health measures. Um, it's not all bad. Um, so uh, Darren Warburton from UBC and colleagues um, did a six-week trial um, where they compared game bike bicycles, um, so it's like a racing game while bicycling, um, with video games using, or sorry, with um, stationary bikes where you just listen to music as you pedal. And, um, they found everything was better in the video game conditions, so better adherence, um, higher energy expenditure, and they actually did see health benefits after only six weeks. So that was kind of a positive um, example. Um, but we're going to talk about this in a bit, but in our own eight-week trial of our Liberty Extra game, we found good adherence um, over eight weeks, so actually higher participation in the eighth week than in the first week. So it's a very unclear picture. Um, but it is definitely clear that if you take a game and you just dump it in someone's house, um, it's no different from any other intervention. They, they will, after a while, tail off and stop playing it. Um, so, and in a sense, it shouldn't be a big surprise. I don't know how many of you are video game players, but I'm, I'm going to guess most of you. Um, the, over time, people become bored with the games they're playing. 
And, um, and, and the, the nice thing about the video game industry is that if you're tired of a game, you can go buy a new one and play that one instead. The same winds up being true of vector games. Um, you know, why would we expect that people uh, get tired of playing Call of Duty and want to play something else? Um, why would we expect they'd want to play the same extra game every day for months and months on end? Um, so that really is a motivation for this conversion approach of um, taking off-the-shelf games and turning them into extra games. Um, that um, it could potentially provide us with a source of many, many games. So if you can relatively cheaply convert games into extra games, then you have all that effort that, that um, the big AAA companies have put into developing the games now available to you. So this is what we looked at. So the basic approach is um, we take games where the player controls an avatar. Um, we worked specifically with two games to begin with, um, Skyrim and Half-Life 2. Um, and then change the game so the pedaling moves the avatar. Now that in itself is, um, it's a start. You know, if you want to have your avatar move forward, you've got to pedal. Um, it's not terribly novel. There are products, for example, the PC Gamer Bike Mini does this as a product you can purchase today, so that's kind of cool. You pedal and, and it, um, it winds up controlling the avatar in, in any game of your choice. Um, we suspected that um, the energy expenditure uh, coming from this would not be adequate, so we also threw in the heart rate power-ups that we talked about um, in the last part of the talk. And we built a novel toolkit which makes it easy to do this. So here, um, here's uh, the first game, is, um, which we call Firem, which is uh, Exercise Skyrim. And so Skyrim is um, you know, a very, very popular um, role-playing game where you control a character that can hear the character as a wizard um, and engages in combat and looting and so forth. Here the heart rate power-up has just come on, and you can see the effect that the weapon has this kind of glowy thing about it. The character becomes more powerful, he has higher stamina, does more damage, um, heals faster. So in general, it's the same idea as what we talked about with the heart rate power-ups before. This is a big advantage to having the power-up. What the toolkit is doing for us, in this case, is, um, is monitoring the player's heart rate and communicating to the game that that increased heart rate should give those special effects. In addition, the, the toolkit is overlaying this little heart rate symbol um, on top of the game as it's playing so that you can see how close you are to the target. So in this case, uh, they've, they've reached the target, so they're, uh, they're there. Um, here's the other game, which we call Half Life, or the exercise version of Half Life 2. And um, so, Half Life is a, um, there you saw the power up was just going on there, um, with that kind of swirly motion. Um, this is a first person shooter game with uh, puzzle elements. Um, and so we can see, again, having the power up um, gives increased stamina, gives increased hit points. Um, it gives the player unlimited ammunition, so normally in Half-Life you have to go collecting ammunition, so there are definite advantages to having the heart rate power. And again, you see the same idea that, um, that the overlay is showing the heart rate information, and the toolkit is providing information to the game, which we use to implement the power. Um, so, uh, I wish I could tie the bow on this and say that we've therefore proved that people will play extra games for years on end, but um, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, we've only done this on two games, and it's really more proof of concept than, than complete uh, games that you could really play for lengthy periods of time. Um, but we tried it out on the two games, and we actually looked at three conditions. So a control condition was people just playing sitting on a couch, so no exercise at all. We then did a pedaling version where all we had was the pedal to control the avatar, and the third was um, the heart rate power-up condition where um, they got the special benefits and gain for getting their heart rate into the target heart rate zone. And um, so this is a slightly more complicated graph than the last one, but uh, lots of interesting results in here. Um, first of all, no surprise that the control condition showed uh, very low exertion levels. Um, and no difference between the two games. So the, the dark blue is Half-Life and the light blue is the Skyrim game. Um, so, and, and why is there anything here at all? Why is it not just zero? It's because when someone's sitting on a couch playing, their heart is not at their resting heart rate, it's a bit above. But this gives us a baseline to look at. 
Then in the peddling condition, we saw somewhat of an increase, but it's pretty anemic. So, you know, kind of 25-ish to 27-ish um, percent of heart rate reserve, which is well, well below um, the recommended levels for exercise. Um, it's a help. It does reduce, remember we talked right at the beginning about the number of sedentary hours that kids spend a day. This is taking away from those sedentary hours. So I don't want to say it's a bad thing to have these low levels, but it's not going to make you fit. Um, and then the power-up condition, we see actually quite a significant jump um, that, um, that in, in the case of Half-Life, we're getting up into the low 30s, and in the case of Skyrim, we're um, pushing that 40% level, um, which is the minimum level um, for recommendations. In both cases, we're still a bit below the minimum recommended levels for exercise, but we're getting a lot closer. Um, one other interesting thing which we'll come back to is that there is actually a significant difference between the two games. So a lot more exercise in Skyrim than in Half-Life. Um, and so we'll come back to that. Just let me show you a quick picture of the toolkit. Um, so again, we're, we're assuming that someone's pedaling, so we get pedal cadence information, and they have a heart rate monitor that happens to be a Mio Alpha or a Mio Link heart rate monitor they're wearing on their arm. That's communicated to the toolkit by a wireless protocol called Ant Plus. So that's a standard protocol that a lot of exercise devices um, implement. The toolkit then does two things with that information. First of all, it generates that overlay that goes on top of the game. And the overlay is very customizable, you know, XML, this and that. Um, and so that winds up being placed on top of the game. And in addition, it communicates with the game itself through key presses. So um, it basically injects keystrokes into the game. Um, what you have to do when you're designing one of these is to pick keystrokes that are not used by the game that can be then used by this. So, you know, for example, you might use a semicolon to indicate cadence levels. Then the trick is, to get these to actually do something, we use the game's um, modding interfaces. So Half-Life, for example, has a C++-based interface where you can literally change anything in the game. Um, Skyrim has its own uh, programming language um, that is used for doing modifications in the game. Again, it allows very, very sophisticated changes of the behavior of the game. And these modding interfaces are um, increasingly popular in games. Um, that um, we found in 2014, for example, 30 major releases which have included sophisticated modding interfaces that would be suitable for this kind of conversion. So this seems like, um, and we're talking about the mods are less than 100 lines of code to do what I showed you earlier. So it's actually very feasible to do these. For a new developer, um, we measured about three weeks of work for someone who had never touched this stuff before to make the Half-Life 2 mod and compared to creating an extra game from scratch, that's actually very reasonable. Um, okay, so let's pull together everything we've said about exertion before we uh, change topics. So heart rate power-ups wind up being highly effective in custom extra games, and we're getting us into this moderately vigorous exercise level. In off-the-shelf games, we were finding we were doing um, a lot better than a simple pedaling conversion, um, but really only barely reaching the minimum recommendations and so we're kind of not quite there yet. Um, the barriers to exertion in these games turned out to, to have, you know, this came out through interviews with the participants after. It seemed like there were really two barriers, particularly in the Half-Life game. So the first is a cognitive barrier, that um, the game involves puzzle solving in some parts, and if you're trying to solve a puzzle while pedaling like crazy, it's, it's kind of hard, and so people would ease off during the puzzle solving parts. And the second is, the game involves a lot of close aiming. So with Skyrim, there's less aiming. You can kind of just wail around with your weapon and, and it's good enough. With Half-Life, you actually have to carefully aim a reticle, uh, target reticle on the target. And doing that again while pedaling really hard is difficult in the game, causing people to ease off. Um, we are, we're going to do some work of extending the mod, particularly in Half-Life 2, to add in aiming assistance when people are in the target heart rate zone in hope that this can this can help with that particular problem and perhaps get higher levels of exertion. Okay, so um, next topic, we're gonna to talk about um, um, our work in extra games for children with cerebral palsy. This work is done in uh, very close collaboration with um, 
Darcy Failings, who's a physician director at um, Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Toronto. Um, and a whole host of uh, students and programmers have worked on this over um, uh, the last four years. Um, so this is a child with cerebral palsy. And uh, he, um, you can see is that uh, what is called the GMSCS, or Gross Motor uh, Function Classification System Level 3, which means that he's capable of walking uh, with the aid of a walker. Um, so you can see he is mobile, he's able to get around in his environment, which is great. Um, on the other hand, he's not going to go out and play soccer with the other kids. Okay. Here we see him um, using a special tricycle um, that was again developed for kids with CP, and so it is actually possible to do cycling-like motions. Um, whoops, wasn't the button that did. So, um, for kids with CP, um, physical exercise is actually very important. Um, so first of all, kids with CP tend not to get enough exercise, and so come back to everything I said earlier about the importance of exercise. And second, um, CP is not a condition that gets worse. It's a neurological damage that does not get worse over the years, but the symptoms of CP do get worse that basically, as kids get older and heavier, um, their muscular development does not keep pace, and therefore they tend to lose mobility. So for example, and we've been doing this long enough that I've actually seen this in person, that we can start with kids who are able to move around with canes or a walker, then wind up progressing into a wheelchair, which they push by themselves, and then wind up progressing into a, a motorized wheelchair where they're kind of using a joystick to move around. And so this kind of, um, this can be slowed by doing physical activity that will help um, increase muscular strength over time as well. And so this is a lot of the motivation for why we do this work. So the livery game is another pedal to play game. We've, we've seen examples of these so far. Um, we have found it to support moderate to vigorous levels of exercise, and it's designed around the abilities of kids with, um, and youth um, with cerebral palsy, which I'm gonna talk about. That's the main point of this section. Uh, they play from home, um, so we've actually been putting devices in kids' homes to allow them to play, and they can play with friends over a network. Um, to design livery, we um, carried out a year-long uh, participatory design process. This is Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, where we have a bunch of kids playing a prototype of the game. This is um, our Gekku Race racing game. Um, we went to the hospital roughly every two months, and uh, during that period we worked with the kids, we'd get their ideas about what they'd like to see in the games, get them to try out the prototypes, and then move on to the, uh, to the next part. Um, in order to support the game, we actually, and then, you know, you, you get involved in a project, you sometimes have no idea where it's going to take you. I did not know that we were going to turn into bike designers, but that's, uh, that's what we wound up having to do. Um, we tried out many, many off-the-shelf um, biking systems, and none of them worked um, sufficiently. We started out with um, two of the eight kids we were working with were able to pedal at all, and simply through refinements of the bicycle, uh, we were able to get that up to seven of eight kids were able to were able to pedal. And of the kids we were targeting at this GMSCS level three, or kids who can move with a mobility aid, we were able to get 100% of them able to pedal. So um, this is the thing we call it the racer bike, that hopefully something the kids would find exciting. Um, and so the basic idea is it's a converted recumbent bicycle that uh, came from uh, Sears. Um, attached to the bicycle is a, an off-the-shelf device called a PC Gamer Bike Mini, which can deliver cadence information, and so these get bolted together. And then there are a bunch of, and then uh, uh, the, this is an all-in-one PC mounted on a stand so that it's in front of them. The bike has low entry so that it's easier to get in and out of, which is actually a very significant part of, um, of being able to use this system. There are assistive supports like non-slip fabric on the bike, um, lateral supports to help hold people in place, um, special pedals where the feet get strapped in and held into a particular um, uh, location, um, and for some kids, um, a special um, 
basically piece of plastic to stop uh, the scissoring of the knees where the knees kind of cross over um, and uh, make it more difficult to pedal. So one thing we found out basically on day one of our participator design process, you know, where we were asking the kids what they like to play, is that both boys and girls like fast-paced, action-oriented games. Um, and um, really, there was just no, um, no difference from what would be typical of kids their age, which um, shouldn't be surprising. Um, the fast pace of these games is a good match with extra gaming, so that's a good thing. So games which um, your avatar is moving fast and there's excitement in the game goes, in a sense, naturally with fast pedaling. Um, we consulted, there are many published design guidelines for um, developing for kids with disabilities, and these guidelines tended to push very much in the other direction of um, saying that they, um, the games for kids with motor disabilities should be very slow paced um, in order that um, the people can uh, keep up while they're playing. And so this is a big conflict that, you know, we know we want fast paced action oriented games and the guidelines are telling us not to do this. So here's an example, this is a selection of uh, guidelines coming from a number of sources. So avoid fast pace, do not require precise timing. That's actually an important one. If you have fine motor disabilities, then um, you know a lot of games are designed where the controller is kind of like an accordion. You have to be able to press three buttons at once and carefully time actions. That's very difficult. Provide a simple control scheme, the same idea. Do not require multiple simultaneous actions. Avoid repeated inputs like button matching, boom, 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 boom. Again, it's hard if you have fine motor disability. And automate the player input is another one. Um, of all of these, we, we use this one and we use that one, and the rest we basically threw away. So here's um, the six extra games we designed for this population. We've already seen a couple of them. We saw the Beery Brawl fighting game, and we saw the Dota Quest uh, kind of platformer game. This is a space hockey game played by, you know, the players are divided into teams. This is um, a defense game where you're defending these little Wiscan characters from evil cat zombies um, played cooperatively. Um, this is a racing game, so you're to be the first Geku lizard to reach the top of the track. Um, this is a roundup game where you're trying to collect these sheep and bring them back to the barn. So a, a kind of a wide range of styles of games, but I think what you can see with all of them is they're all fast paced. So how did we accomplish this? First, let's talk about the main areas that we need to design around with kids with CP. So first is um, manual ability, um, so which really comes down to the ability to manipulate buttons and joysticks on a controller. Um, it's measured by uh, something called the MACS, Manual Ability uh, Classification System. Gross motor control, again, we were aiming for GMFCS level three, which is kids who can move with a mobility aid, and that really boils down to pedaling ability. Uh, visual motor integration, um, it turns out the kids with CP often have um, um, deficits in visual spatial processing, and what that means is, for example, the inability to hold a map in their head. So, um, if you kind of move around in, for example, a game which requires you to remember what's over there and where it is, that's something that they would have difficulty with. Um, but sorry, that's visual spatial processing. Visual motor in, um, integration would be, um, you know, what happens if you're playing baseball. You put up your hand to catch the ball as it goes. Uh, so that ability to um, um, predict from the movement of a ball that your hand needs to be here to catch it is also an area where there um, are often deficits in kids with CP. So um, for manual ability, we move to um, a one button control that basically at any time there is a single action that is active. We're using standard Xbox controllers, so um, where there are four buttons, hitting any of the buttons or even hitting them all at once has the same effect um, of, uh, of performing the one action that's available at any time. So the games always have to be defined so that there was a single action. Um, at the same time, we use this left joystick to select um, direction in which the character is moving. So that's what the kids have to be able to do, is uh, kind of select a direction and um, at times press a single button. And the, and the interface was on all the games was designed around that. You can see here, here's an The kids use the controllers in radically different ways. So um, uh, this person is 
holding the controller here, and you can see that he has a great deal of difficulty um, doing precise actions with his right hand, but is able to kind of guide the controller with his right hand and then use the thumb to hit the button when necessary. Um, we saw a lot of, for example, one-handed um, motion where they'd hold the controller in one hand, move the joystick with this hand, and then press the button when they needed to, for example. So lots of different approaches. Um, gross motor control. Um, the games adapt to the player's pedaling ability, um, and they do this. Um, what we do is we do before kids play the game is we do a test of their pedaling ability and then basically have a configuration value that goes into the game where the mapping of their cadence to in-game speed is adjusted. Um, another consequence of this is, <coughs> again, this is something I did not think about that is obvious in retrospect. If, uh, so, for typically developing people, um, pedaling is habituated. Um, which means that um, you don't have to think about the activity of pedaling, it just, it just kind of happens. If you have CP, you have to spend a lot of effort thinking about the movement of your legs in order to make a smooth pedaling motion. And so this means you have less attention available for the game itself. Some of our initial game designs were just too complicated or someone who is spending so much effort thinking about the pedaling to also be thinking about the strategy that's involved in the game. And so we wound up having to make the games simple enough that, um, that they could be playable even by people uh, with growth motor disabilities. The visual motor integration. Um, so low reliance on hand-eye coordination, um, low reliance on aiming. Um, here, for example, is in this Gecko Race game, one thing you can do is uh, you have a little flamethrower that your lizard can throw out. We have lots of cartoony violence. Kids enjoy cartoony violence, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so it shoots that flame in kind of a cone. And that way there's less reliance on aiming. You don't have to carefully line up where you're, where you're going at. The consequence of this is that you just kind of fall down a little bit and then lose some ground and have to catch up. Um, and low penalty for error is an important thing. So for example, in the Dozo Quest platformer game, if you fall off a platform, um, you don't have to kind of go and spend several minutes making up lost ground. Uh, there's a very quick route to get back to where you were so that you don't have a sense of, um, of frustration over, um, over having made errors. And visual spatial processing. Um, so for example, avoiding complicated mazes. So again, in that Dozo Quest game, which is a maze, there's kind of an illusion of it being a maze. So for example, there'll be points where the maze will branch off in two directions but those two directions come back again to the same place. So you feel like you're going through a maze, but if you're having trouble navigating the maze um, uh, visually, um, there's no particular problem. And also we provided visual play cues for, uh, for locating other players if they're going to fly those later on. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so the basic idea was here, we're, we're saying rather than starting from what kids with CP can't do, we're trying to consider that they can play these action-oriented sort of games if it's designed specifically around their ability. Um, so this led to a series of revised guidelines, um, simplifying level geometry, simplifying the level flow, so that idea of this and having reduced consequences of errors, limit the um, available actions that players have um, uh, to them, so for example, uh, this idea that there's always exactly one thing you can do and therefore you only have a requirement of one button you need to be pushing. Um, removing the need for precise positioning and aiming um, so that, uh, you know, kind of uh, to take account of um, deficits and fine motor control. Making the game state visible um, because of the, visuals, uh, the uh, visual processing deficit. And balancing for effort, um, which is this idea that different people pedaling with different ability levels can still play together. <coughs> okay, so. Um, I'm going to skip over. I have just. I'm going to skip over these. Okay, so um, we had a trial with. Um, we've done actually several in home trials with this, but um, we did a trial with um, eight kids at this GMFCS level three over six weeks. And we asked them to play three times a week for 30 minutes. There was a concern that if they played more than that, that um, it may lead to injury. And it turned out we met both the heart rate and the playtime targets. So the average number of minutes played per week was 190. This is actually significantly over the 90 we were looking at. 
And on average, they were getting about 78 minutes over their target heart rate um, per week. So that's not enough to be making um, the 30 minutes um, a day recommendation, but it's, it's something, you know, so it can, that can be added to other forms of activity and, um, and, and, can, be, um, uh, and can be helped. And we actually did see fitness improvements in this one. So using um, a measure called the shuttle run test, um, we saw an improvement and um, the, the effect signs indicated a large effect. So all good news there. I'm going to ask how much time I've got. Um, kind of scheduled an hour, but it's it, like if people need to leave at 11.30, then they can. And okay, I'll, it's interesting, so. <laughs> I'll go for five more minutes and then, and then wrap up. How about that? Okay, so another issue then with kids with CP is um, social isolation. Um, and it's simply a case that um, for a kid with CP to go out on a play date with another kid, is a major logistical undertaking. Um, it's not just a case of uh, grabbing a snack and dumping the kid in the car and driving them somewhere. There's a lot of equipment that has to go. Often it involves ordering wheel trans, which is special transportation. And so kids with CP often wind up spending most of their time interacting with adults, um, which is um, you know, not ideal for social development. Um, and so the game was designed to allow kids to play from home um, using the standard internet and also to play with other people um, in groups. And so here we see, uh, you know, we're using a standard headset to, to do voice over IP communication and also being able to see other players' avatars in the game world and be able to play with them. And it turned out that social interaction was a very important part of the motivation of kids to play. Um, so, so what were some of the things we had to do to try and make the game work better as a social game, a game for kids with CP. Um, one thing is that a barrier to grouping in a lot of games, think of World of Warcraft, for example, is that to meet up with other people, you may be in radically different parts of the world, and it takes a long time to get together. So we designed the game world such that getting from one point to another point should never take more than a minute. And so if you make an intention to get together with someone else, it's not that big a deal to be able to get there. Um, so this is showing the different parts of the different mini-games and the different routes to get from one to another. Another is frictionless group formation. So um, part of group formation is being able to find other people. Um, and so in order to help with that, we use these things that we call stickers, which are basically little, um, in, little uh, indicators of where the other person is, basically what direction they are if they're not currently on screen. And that makes it easier to find people because you just kind of follow the sticker, follow through the portal if necessary, and so forth. And all the kids had customized avatars um, that you know made these stickers unique. Um, so in looking at the social aspects, we did another trial. So 10 participants over 10 weeks. Uh, they were actually divided into two cohorts. We didn't have 10 bicycles, so we couldn't have uh, 10 kids all playing at the same time. Again, three times a week for 30 minutes. Um, we had the server open six days a week for one and a half hours a day only. And the idea there was to, by re restricting the open time, was to, to make it more likely there'd be someone else to play with. You know, if you've only got six people in your cohort, and you pick any random time of day, odds are there won't be someone else there. And to keep things more interesting, we introduced new games every second week. So there was kind of new content to look forward to. We had a lot of uh, measures. We had game monitors who provided reports each day. Uh, we had lots of blog files, questionnaires. There was a Facebook group where the kids could communicate and so forth. Um, so here's just a selection of some of the things that came out of this. Um, on average, people uh, chose to play with others a lot of the time. So when others were people were available to play with, around 70% of the time people chose to play with other people, which indicates they were getting some value out of the social engagement. Um, people played longer when there were other people, again indicating that there, there must have been some, some benefit to having other people to play with, so um, 50 minutes versus 37 minutes. Um, people tended to prefer the games that had cooperative play, um, and in fact this preference became stronger as more people were online, so um, Gecko Race was a competitive racing game, it was very popular. 
But the most popular game was this Wiskin defense, uh, zombie defense game, um, which is played cooperatively. Um, Dota Quest is also a cooperative game, but not as amenable to single player, uh, to uh, multiplayer play. Um, the kinds of, uh, yeah, so some of the things that came out of this, so um, I just love this quote where one kid uh, announced when someone else came on, yay, I don't have to play alone anymore. Um, in general, people played with others when there were others available to play with and played longer. Um, it was actually really beautiful. They played very inclusively. So we saw examples of, uh, for example, one participant coming into the game who was um, unable to play a particular game or had difficulty with it, the Wiskin game. Um, and the entire group, in order to accommodate her, moved over to another game in order to play. So there wasn't this kind of, we don't care if you can't play, it's, well, no, we want to make it a good experience for you as well. Uh, we saw a coaching kind of behavior where people, um, as a new game would come out, you'd get the early adopter who would uh, attempt to learn the game quickly and then teach the other people how to play the game and got a lot of pleasure out of that kind of social interaction. Um, so, okay, so this is now <laughs> the summary for the whole talk. Um, so we talked uh, really about um, a bunch of things. So the importance of designing for exertion, um, so like with our heart rate power-ups. We talked about how we have been doing some work into converting off-the-shelf games into extra games um, and, you know, our fire and calf life games um, and how the toolkit makes that easy to do and how the heart rate power-ups give some benefit, although they're still not as good as custom design games. And we talked about the design of action-oriented extra games for children with CP and the social aspects of such games. Um, next things that we're, so we're continuing to work on this game balancing idea. Ultimately what we want is something that the kids with CP told us on the very first day we met with them, which is that they want to be able to play with their typically developing peers. And so that turned out to be a much bigger problem than you might think, and that's something we um, are, are working on ongoing with a new PhD student working on that now. Um, we're doing some clinical work, so we're setting up next year um, an after-school program with the Liberty Game um, and uh, Sunny Hill Hospital in Vancouver. Um, we're also um, going to be setting up an in-school program, taking this to children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, there, the idea is that exercise in that population has been linked to improved sleep and improved uh, mood regulation. Um, and so there's a, a lot of interest in how that could work out. And um, we're also moving into games for repetitive motion exercises like strength training or, um, or uh, traditional rehab as well. So those are kind of the things that are going on moving forward. So thank you. So feedback loops in, in uh, human emotional systems would suggest that when you elevate your heart rate, you actually enjoy the game more. Uh, do you have any sort of subjective reactions? From uh, we even have objective. Um, yeah, we, we did measure enjoyment. And um, in the games with the heart rate power-ups, uh, enjoyment was higher. That wasn't obvious to us. We thought that by that maybe people would feel the need to exercise harder to, uh, to get the in-game benefits, but maybe they'd be kind of pissed off about it. <laughs> and uh, that turned out not to be true. Their enjoyment was higher. It seemed to be both a number of things that they enjoyed the challenge, uh, gave them an extra challenge in the game, and um, and um, they enjoyed getting the benefits as well. Uh, so you, in your next step, you mentioned uh, allowing people to uh, access, do exercise games together, and that, that special group you have this whole notion of social activity, and we know that in uh, physical activities, having a body is really important as a, as a motivation. In the previous projects, did you have any earlier studies on comparing multiplayer gameplays or single players to see how the effect on persistence of the continuing doing this exercise? We did, um, I have some unconclusive results. <laughs> so we did a long-term study um, together with Ryan Rose at University of Victoria um, where we actually ran 80 kids through the system. Um, we had 40 of them in Victoria, 40 in Kingston. Um, and um, half of them were playing single player, half of them were playing multiplayer. Our hypothesis was that the multiplayer players would play more, um, and it turned out not to be the case. Um, I, our suspicion is that there may be some methodological issues in there that, uh, that 
in that particular group, even the people who were um, online together were not playing together as much as in the other group. Uh, one thing that Anthony and I are working on is this whole notion, but not just multiplayer, but having a buddy. Because I mean, when you are exercising with your partner, with your friend, or somebody in particular, you have, you and that person are always seeing each other. You know, if he's going or she's going, you want to yeah. go too. So when it's a particular person, it's yeah. different from just a random person. You go to the gym and there are people, but if there is that particular person that you always work with, exactly. And I think that's why we saw better results in the social side with the kids with CP is that they have frankly, immediately in common, the fact that their kids with CP, mm. which gives a kind of a basis for a conversation. Some of them knew each other from before, from other programs in the hospital, um, whereas the kids we recruited um, for the broader study, the typically developing study, mm. uh, did not know each other and were actually a little younger, which made, made them more reticent as well. So I think if I were doing that again, I would, I would at the minimum, have a, an in-person meetup first before right. playing the game just to kind of break the social ice a little bit. Well, <coughs> sorry, when you were doing the study with uh, Thyrome and Cat Life, yeah. <laughs> um, did you notice any performance difference between when they were just sitting using the controller and when they were using the controller while pedaling? Like, were there more false inputs, perhaps, when they were pedaling? We, um, we did not measure game performance in that sense, and I'm not even sure how we would in those games, but um, I think it's an interest. It's something I want to look at further, um, and we have to figure out a way of doing it. Okay. Kind of related to that, but did uh, you see a difference in the way people use, the, say, heart rate power-ups and things like that, um, based on what their skill level or their familiarity with the game was? Like, would, did they use it strategically? We. Um, so in the, in the first study that we did of the heart rate power-ups, the ones in the library games, the custom games, we actually did have um, a condition that I didn't report here just because you know, of time, um, where we, we did split between expert and novice players. And the hypothesis was that the novice players would be more incentive to get the power-up than the expert players, because the expert players would need it less. And we actually found no effect. Uh, when when designing different games, let's say, do you know if there's uh, a better, do you find it better to make a game designed for a more sustained heart rate during longer periods of time, or shorter, higher bursts of like extreme activity and then some downtime? Um, it depends what you mean by better. <laughs> So in terms of, uh, I mean, certainly for, for um, athletes, um, we're certainly being told that, um, that um, interval training is the best way of, uh, of getting effect in the short period of time. Um, in these extra games, which are you know, really trying to blend entertainment and, um, and activity and are trying to target people who are not necessarily active, I'm not sure that interval training is the right place to start, but um, I think it's something that you know, you could easily wind up going for. Um, so our game, the, the racing game, the Gecko race game, kind of is a form of interval training because you have these people go very high intensity up the track and then there's a bit of a break where they fall down the next round starts and then high intensity again. That was a very popular game. But most of them are, do, not, do not have that property. When you were adapting off the shelf games, was there a design decision behind, say, adapting first-person shooter style games versus, say, something like a racing game that might uh, apply more directly to the idea of pedaling? Um, our original idea was we were going to do three games and we, you know, we didn't have the time to do all three and the third one was going to be a racing game. Um, we have built racing extra games in the past and they are available as commercial products. Like pretty much any commercial cycling-based game involves racing of some form. So we thought that was one that needed less um, investigation. That definitely is the most successful kind. Gekku Race is a racing game, you know, and, and, and so, um, yeah, they're very successful. And in a sense, um, we were interested in trying games that were not that, to, to see if we could get games that were less traditionally used. Okay, well, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you.